Welcome to Strength Chat Podcast, presented by Kabuki Strength. Introducing your hosts, Chris Duffin, the mad scientist of strength, Rudy Cadlow, mature athlete and coach, and the wizard of training himself, Brandon Sen. Welcome to Strength Chat with your host, the mad scientist of powerlifting, Chris Duffin. To my right, our mature athlete and, and coach, Rudy Cadlow. To my left, the wizard of training, Brandon Sen. I use that term loosely, by the way. What? Better than the wizard in the closet. <laughs> Oh, now you're bringing it up. <laughs> All right, today we've got a special guest, Kelly Starrett, and uh, we're really excited to have Kelly on. Uh, Kelly brings a tremendous voice to uh, to our training world, and I, I think most of our listeners are probably pretty familiar with who he is, but uh, Kelly, can you start off by just telling us, I guess, how did you get headed down you know a little bit about yourself, but how you got headed down the path that you're that you're on. I mean, oh man, you're you're, you know, you're a physical therapist by by trade, but you're you know you're you're sent, you're producing so much content, challenging actually the physical therapy world, challenging strength coaches. Like, how how did this come about? You know, I, I'm glad you brought it up because you know one of the things that's always missing from this conversation is context. You know about where we came from, how we've been solving problems. I mean. If you just set the Wayback Machine for 15 years, you know, the, the model was lift until you break, back off, let's lift a little further and hope we get for, you know, further next time. And then break again, back off. I mean, literally that is what we did. And that's how we, we threw a lot of eggs against the wall. And the things that you guys are talking about and smart coaches are looking at in terms of improving positional quality is really a relatively new concept. I mean, we have been divorcing. I mean, we've been talking about technique forever until we're blue in the face, right? And all you have to do is go hang out with a master coach and they have 27,000 skill transfer exercises to solve a problem. But that problem is you're missing shoulder interrotation or you're stiff upper back, right? And so, you know, we can, we can drill around it. But when we started, you know, reconciling the physiology with the incomplete mechanic, and seeing how that was expressed with you know, power output, wattage, anything that matters to us, it became a simple issue. This is, this is mechanics, this is simple mechanics. Not did you squat the bar up and down or there's, you know, there's enough variability in humans to like, make everyone a precious snowflake. No, no, that's all crap. It really comes down to you know, the physiology is known to us and, you know, and I think the real issue is, you know, I came out of a national slalom team program. So I was paddling on the national slalom team, whitewater slalom, it's an esoteric sport. But I, you know, was training two and three times a day, you know, it fell into that trap that if I outworked everyone, then that would take care of it, right? If I just worked harder and worked more until I paddled until I made my hand, right hand numb and uh, that ended my career. And I looked around, and that was literally the, the normal you know, process for the entire National Psalm team. You know, you paddle till you broke, back off. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, we, we knew this would happen. It's just totally normal. And I was like, you knew this would happen. And, just, uh, just and you of, let me do it? Just a matter of time. <laughs> it's a matter of time. You know? and, and really, because it's because you know, the, the world of physio or the world of, you know, maybe you, you, know, you, you knew Dr. You know, Dr. Rudolph over there. And you were lucky to have a <laughs> Thank you for the, thank a for, for the respect there. That's right. You're, you're, you're lucky to have a ninja or, you know, you, you train with someone like Chris Duffin early on and you found, you know, someone who was paying attention to mechanics, paying attention to tissue health. You know, so those, those people existed, but the Internet did not exist and how we shared that information did not exist. And, you know, even when I went to physio school, I went to a really good physical therapy school here that is heavy manual approach, heavy movement based. And yet I could not reconcile what I was learning in rehab and physio with how we were actually training and moving. There was, there was a complete gap. And, you know, I think if I didn't already, if I wasn't already training in strength and conditioning and I wasn't already, you know, studying as a physio, I would miss it. But I had to really, there was a lot of dissonance. And people forget that, you know, even just 10 years ago, this didn't exist. The way we talk about it, you know, reconciling technique, you know, the, the tools that you guys come up with, the, the models of, of, of how we're managing these problems, it just, it was a vacuum. And, uh, and subsequently, we've stepped into it, and that's literally how I got here. Trying to make sense of what we did and how we trained and how we got people to the NFL and the Olympics, and what the hell was going on with rehab, because it was just two different languages. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, 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 I remember this, and it's that mentality and I, I speak a lot on mental toughness and stuff but it's never like push yourself into that point of you know damage there's pushing yourself within the limits but 
you know, that was the mentality is like, you're, you're going to be broken. You're going to be beat up. And guess what? I'm, I'm broken and beat up because I, I grew up in that environment. I don't want people to be like that. But on the other side, like you're saying, the, you know, if you take an elite athlete and go to a physio or a Cairo or a doctor during that time, the answer is always, well, you got to quit training, take some time off. And so it's too vastly different. I think they fed each other, right? Almost because, you know, if the, if, if the, the message in the training world is you just got to outwork everybody constantly, you know. Um, and we recently had uh, Stuart uh, McGill on, and he was speaking to the same thing, going, Americans, they're the hardest working people, you know, in the planet. I work all around the planet, and that's what they do with their training is outwork everyone. And it's not always the answer. And then on the opposite side, you know, so it's like, well, we need people to take a break. And, uh, you know, then, then our athletes don't want to go to somebody to get help because they know what the message is going to be. Oh my God, if I go in there for this ankle issue or, you know, this, you know, back issue or whatever it is, I'm going to get taken out. Right. When there, there's, you know, two important pieces around that. One is that the, uh, the, the plausible deniability is what we call that blind training effort. Because what you can do is that you can always turn around and say, look how hard I worked. I just broke. It's not my fault, right? I, I worked my butt off. And we see athletes, it's, a, it's almost like a form of di- addiction. It's a form of uh, a problem. Hang on one second, guys. Hey, J-Star, you shut the door, please? Sorry about that, guys. I, I, I love the dog in the interview, by the way. <laughs> it's, it's classic. That's Pete. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I, yeah, want, we, I want Pete we got, back. We're done talking to you. Okay. Hey, Pete. Is that Pete Star? Is that Pete, Pete Star? Pete Star. <clears throat> I wish. So we have this issue that people are um, you know, killing themselves because it, it gives us an, es- an excuse and an, an out. Because if something doesn't go wrong, at least I have this body of blind effort. Even though I'm overtrained, tissues are trapped, nervous systems crap. I mean, I just, you know, uh, you know I'm, I'm not making progress, but I'm just working, 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 working. And you know, we just have got to be smarter about that, and we have got to give people the tools to reconcile or understand when the bar's not moving fast, you know, and, and all those tools, are, you know, are there for us in the training world because we, we've figured this out again and again and again. You know, if your bar speed isn't there, then you're like, well, well maybe something's up, or if, you know, you're, you know the, the load feels like a billion pounds, something's up, or if, you know, you're, you're, you know your resting heart rate is high, I mean, just check the boxes that matter to you in your sport, you know, and you know, the other thing is just that you know, the, the, because the world has changed around you know, doctors, you know, physios not feeding it in, and you're speaking to the truth is that going to any NFL team, any NBA team, all, and, and we're trying to change this, and the smart coaches are, the players are very distrustful of the system. And this is not anecdote. This is, you know, this is the truth. <laughs> evidence that athletes will not ask for problems. They will not ask for help early. They won't even tell their strength coach, who's the most trusted person in the building, about the problems because it goes on some report. It goes, on, you know, and then and and God forbid you go down some hallway and you don't you leave the team, you leave the training environment, and now you're in some you know parallel universe where they speak Esperanto, and they're like, and you're like, what is this? I don't even. This doesn't even doesn't even speak to me, and my whole athletic experience suddenly is is radically changed and in a different language. This is, I mean, we've got to reconcile it. And I'll be frank, if you're a physical therapist or provider, when you can't tell a continuum between what you're doing and why that makes deadlifting more efficient, right? You know, for example, then you have a problem in your language. So you've got to take the movement thing first and be able to backfill to explain why your PT or rehab or theory around stabilization or stiffness matters. And, and, you know, on the converse, if you're coaching somebody in the lift or let's say you're a deadlift coach um, and you see issues in the lift, you know, that they're not they're not able to perform the lift correctly. You should be able to be able to know why that is what's happening and be able to say, hey, I need you to go see somebody for, you know, this specific issue if they're not able to manage that themselves. I mean, it's a it's a team effort. Like, yeah, you don't have to be able to fix everybody and do everything. No, but but you you need. You should take it off the table, too, because as a coach, if your job is to improve people's positions and you teach positions and you don't have any skills on improving someone's hip flexion, then what are we even talking about? I mean, you're, a, you're an exercise administrator at that point. You know, you're, you're a cheerleader instead of understanding the nuances. And I'll tell you where we have put the most of our energy and things that you're doing is exactly what you're talking about. We've got we've realized that if we're waiting for the sports medicine 
machine to come down and, and become competent in our world, it's never going to happen. And we've seen it and we're waiting for it. It's not happening. Instead, what we're doing is we're starting to give, say, this is non-skilled care. You don't need to have a doctoral degree for this. Instead, this is what everyone should know and everyone should be able to take a crack at fixing their positions and understanding if that, did that make it better, same, or worse? Did that improve your position or not? I mean, you know, we are empiricists at the heart of what we do, anecdotal empiricists, N of one times 10,000. You know, and, and it's not rocket science. Like, no. I mean, seriously, like, oh, I've got some restricted tissue from the last workout. I don't need to go see a physical therapy or, or a chiropractor or a doctor to deal with that issue. I should be able to handle it myself. I should be able to have a friend handle it. I mean, we did some work when I came down last uh, with with the boomstick. And, you know, you had you were tight, I think, from uh, doing too many uh, overhead processes or, or snatches, I think, like a few days prior. And we sat there, you know, on the table and opened you up in a couple minutes. And, it, and it's, it's, it's got it's got exactly what you're saying. Yeah, and, and if we don't deal with that, yeah, we're going to end up with some issues because you can't, you shouldn't be training when you can't get a joint in the proper position, right? I mean, if you can't get a, in a position to perform a lift, you need to deal with that because that's where our injury mechanisms comes about from that because then you're performing the lift incorrectly or like you said, we're we're over applying training load. We're just a poor coach or a poor athlete, and we're just. <laughs> <laughs> and we're pushing ourselves too far. <laughs> well, you know what's amazing is that um, I'm lucky enough that I get to work at really strange bookends of, of function, right? Like I'll teach, uh, you know, in one week I'll have, you know, 40 kids who are under eight swimming. And then the same week I'll be in the NFL. And then, you know, the, you know I just left the Marine Air Weapons Tactical School, right? And, um, you know, it turns out that we are really good at – making the body do what we need to do at the time. And these kids that I work with, you know, they're swimmers, but they can't put their arms over their head. And I'm like, what? you're not even swimming. You're moving your body. You're not, by definition, you're not even being able to do the technique. But what you're really good at is compensating. And it turns out those kids just go into a banana back when they swim, then they can get their arms over their head. And so, but no one can see it or no one is seeing it because those coaches haven't been trained in being able to be in diagnostics. And for us, the, the easiest diagnostic position is in the weight room. If you're pressing over your head and you can't press over your head, what are we talking about? Yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, this is the fundamental of what we teach is like how to actually see that in, when you're moving. You should be able to, you don't need to do a, a, you know, a, a screen or anything like that. You can see somebody lifting and go, <laughs> we've got some issues to deal with, right? I mean, it's... Assessment under load is much more revealing. It is. And, you know, and, and it's not just load. It's also metabolic demand. You know, what does it look like? What does your 20th squat look like? Because I'll tell you what, it should look like the first squat. You just did 19 practice squats. I know you're fatiguing, but you should be fatiguing and defaulting into better positions, not showing me that you can no longer compensate with your, with your crappy technique. You know, I put you, I get you on the, you know, assault bike, do, do some, uh, you know, some sprints. I'm like, show me how you can pick up that hundred kilos. Cause it's only a hundred kilos. And, and if your strategy goes to shit because you're breathing hard or, you know, or you're a little fatigued, what are we talking about? You know, and I, I think what we're getting better at is finally establishing these bookmarks and, and really clear that every athlete can see it. Hey, elbow is bent, internally rotated armpit, you know, wrist is broken back, head is doing something weird. I mean, you know, those are the flags you're saying, hey, okay, today your position is incomplete. How can we scale that? And understanding also that it is a moving target you know i mean all my friends and i have been talking about you deadlifting 900 for like 27 reps and then and then you, <laughs> it, was, it, it was five but actually 4.9 i think eight but <laughs> well, you know at 900 you get to count 4.98 it doesn't matter right and uh, we we're also talking about um the fact that you do you're handling these loads week after week you know, and that uh, you know, I, I think that's the whole conversation here needs to be about People can actually work harder than they're currently working. They can lift more than they're currently lifting, right? And they can do it more often if you do the things to get your body turned around and, you know, and prepped. And it's, it's part of the training conversation. This is not a disparate or disjointed combo that if you lift heavy, this needs to be done. If you train, if you're a runner, you have to be able to do this. And, you know, even if with our endurance athletes, we see a lot of them. I'm like, hey, look, we're squatting today. They're like, I don't want to get big. I'm like, we're squatting so that your hips work better on the bike. They're like, oh, okay, I'm into that. You know, that these positions are how we reclaim function when we've become specialized. And, 
you know, because we are, the way we're training maybe doesn't reflect our natural loading, right? We've become, you know, even if you have a good movement practice, we're, the way we're hitting it and how often and how hard, you know, it means that it just takes a little bit more love to get your body turned around. And that's part of that training conversation, one. And two, it's just, is this notion that, you know, we have to, um, you know, come to understand that this is a moving target. That if you deadlift really heavy, you know, you may look incomplete the next time you step in the gym because you're incomplete because you didn't do the right things or you had a job. And, and so we've got to have the, the, the positional competency mechanism, right? The diagnostic tightly conjoined with the training system so that we can, we can diagnose those things on the spot. And that is called consilience and that is the unification of knowledge. And that's what we're after. Yeah. And I have, uh, I have like these, uh, standard, you know, warm up procedures for dead, deadlifts and squats and things that I've done. I think I did one with Mark uh, Bell. Tons of people always tell me, oh, I tried that. And I'm like, they're like, do you do that every time? I'm like, no, it actually varies every workout based on what the needs are. Like, here's, you know, I got to pull different things from my bag of tricks, but there's absolutely no way I'd be able to, I mean, Brandon, how long has it been? I've been pulling close to at or above 900 yeah, twice a yeah, week for yeah. months now. Like three it, months <laughs> there's no way i'd be able to do that and uh, i got a i got a funny story to tell though because at home you know I've, I've got a couple kids and they're always leaving stuff all over the house on the floor wife's always trying to help me get uh get me to pick it up i'm like i can't, I can't reach down there i'm too big i'm too immobile i'm too slow I'm too lazy and, and uh <laughs> so so i come home the other day and she's like yeah i was watching this interesting video of you on instagram doing these really fast get-ups off the floor and smoothly getting back down on the floor repeatedly over and over and everybody's commenting how you move so well <laughs> <laughs> like about those toys on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you understand, hon. I don't want to destroy my fitness. Like, I'm, you know, I'm, technically, I should be having this conversation laying down. Like, you could be doing your deadlift prep right now. <laughs> like, I, had this, uh, I had this, uh, this physical therapy. I was doing an inpatient uh, rotation, a cardiac rehab rotation. And um, this woman was an endurance athlete, but the, the, the building had like 13 stories. And she was infamous for just dropping students and crushing them, like because she just took the stairs every day. And like it's day two, and I'm like I'm carrying the walker. And I'm like, oh man, these stairs. And she's like, ha, ah, you know, you gotcha. She's like, you know, you can take the elevator. And I was like, no, no, you don't understand. They're gonna really make me weak. Like, my squat is gonna suck this week. I don't mind. You just gotta understand that I'm paying a price for this. And she's like. She's like, you're saying that these stairs are destroying your fitness? I was like, precisely. That's precisely what they're doing. And hon, exactly. my job is a deadlift heavy weights. And if you, mean, if you want me to pick that up, I will. But I mean, we're going to make less money. I think you just need to. That, 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 that's, that's, that's a great argument. I, I think I've reverted to that several times, actually. <laughs> love it. I love it. You know, in this, uh, this world of high tech, uh, we're exposed to so much media. You mentioned earlier, everyone's looking for the secret uh, exercise. But also, I see people just waiting for the secret pill. You know, can I just take a pill and it's going to make me stronger? It's going to make me more supple? I can do this or that. How, how do we counteract that in such a world of bogus representations and, and false claims from people just trying to get rich quick? I think you really put your hand on an on a important topic there, and that is, you know, if the fitness world is a crowded and shitty space right now. It is really, I mean, there's, there's so many knockoff people. Uh, there was this, there's this ground movement company that now is just marketing towards, you know, better, better mobility, which is the worst word ever of all time towards, uh, you know, towards CrossFitters. And the, and the guy is like front, he's like in the bottom of position of a front squat, you know, but he, he's asked to grasp, but his position suck. His front rack sucks. His knees suck. He obviously has never done it. But, you know, hey, there's a market we can get to. And, and you know, the, the issue is eventually it's, you know, principles are going to remain principles. And, you know, if you go into my Instagram account, like, the, it looks like all I obsess about is eating hamburgers with no buns, drinking, you know, gluten-free vodka, and then lifting heavy weights. Like, that is literally, like, that's what Instagram thinks I do. We, we, need, and, to, we need to hang out more. <laughs> I know, I know. I know. <laughs> And, um, you know, maybe, I, maybe my Instagram throws stuff, too, because I'm Matt Vincent. But um, the idea here is um, 
you know, people have forgotten that there is, it is principles and it is time under tension. It is decades and decades and decades in the making. And, you know, I think places like CrossFit have been amazing because they have put strength and conditioning in, like real strength and conditioning into the hands of mortal people like us, right? I mean, you know, you, maybe you came out of a powerlifting gym lucky as a kid, but maybe you were an Olympic lifting coach, but otherwise now, I mean, my mom has Olympic lifting shoes. I mean, something's up, right? And, um, but I, I think the problem is that there's also some notion that if you train really hard, it's this egalitarian, doc, democratized system that like you too can be elite and everyone's looking for the shortcut to that instead of saying, you know, how are you going to, did you squat heavy once a week for the last 10 years? I mean, how, how long have you been pulling, Chris? Uh, I've been lifting for about 25 years and 25 years. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, I went for a long paddle yesterday. I'm a, uh, I was a professional paddler. I still paddle. I still race, but this is my 31st year of paddling 31 years. And sometimes I go out and paddle, and people are like, wow, you're a good paddler. I'm like, yeah, I started when I was 12. And I used to paddle 300 days a year, and this is what I do. Like, this is the thing. And there's no shortcut to that. And unfortunately, it's difficult for us to see shredded abs and 900-pound deadlifts and be like, what's the, what's the secret to that? And the secret to that is, did you eat six to eight fists of vegetables today? You know, I mean, did you sleep eight hours? You know, and we see these mistakes eight all hours. the time. I, Ten hours. I, that's a nap for me. I, yeah, it's I, gotta be. <laughs> I, this, this is probably the most important thing people are going to hear in this podcast. That, like you just said, eight hours of sleep is not enough, right? No, I mean, that's, absolutely that, not. You, I, I can't function. You can't function. And um, you know, we are working with. Um, I spent a lot of time at Altus, which is formerly the World Athletic uh, Center, and um, they put you know uh, like DeGrasse, who was third in the, the Olympics this year in the hundred. He's a he's an athlete from from there and. Coach Dan Pfaff and Stuart McMillan, they just created this amazing program there. Um, Jeremy Koenig is, uh, is um, a guy that we've had on talk, from Athletogen, talks about genetics and actionable genetics, you know, things that we can understand about you and your ability to recover. Like, for example, I, I see you deadlift 900 a bunch, and I'm like, I, I couldn't handle that. I, if I deadlifted heavy once every two weeks, like, I mean, peak deadlift we're talking about, I'm cooked. And I know from my genetics that I'm at like 13% re- recovery. Like I just am not a – like you – I think you're a vampire and a wolverine all wrapped into one. Like you just regenerate and, you, and, you're, and you're shiny yeah. in the light. No, I've always my whole life like recovered much faster than everybody else. And I put that to use in my tra- – knowing that with my, with my training, right? Because that's my – I wasn't always the strongest. I wasn't always the fastest. I wasn't – you know, I was pretty good, but I recovered better than everybody else. Yeah, well, it turns out I don't recover well. Like my genetics, is, I just I have so I, it's interesting that I've started to dial in all these tools around optimizing, you know, my ability to work hard again. So, turns out that in this group, right, these are Olympians, you know, at the highest level in a very very smart program, and their goal is ten hours of sleep is the baseline. That's the base. If you can get a nap on top of that, everyone's like, yeah, ten hours. Woo! When they actually track that. It comes down to that most people are sleeping eight or less. And, you know, and when they actually put the reaction time in front because they test it, right, you have to prove to the athlete that this is detrimental to your central nervous system because athletes are going to go until they break it's because it's what we do. And you know, then it, it, the athlete was like, oh, my God. But what we're not seeing is you have to take care of first principles, that you have to sleep. And you can't be stressed out all the time. And you better, you know, know how to chill. And you better eat right. And you better, you know, warm up and actually cool down. Those things matter too. And if you apply that for decades and decades and decades, and you have good genetics, you will be excellent. If you don't have good genetics, you'll just be pretty good. And that pretty good is a lifetime's work. And that's the goal. That's the only way we're going to solve this problem, Rudy. Yep. Well, part you know, and what you just said, I had a doctor uh, years ago that told me there are three secrets to a long life, and the, the first one was pick your parents. And you know, genetics is it's hard to ignore, and you know, not everybody is the same for sure, and we we need to be able to recognize that as well. Just because he can do it doesn't mean I can do it necessarily, or should do it. Yeah, right? or should do it. Yeah, and you know, and I, I think that's the. That's the piece that we're going to have to get across. And, and unfortunately, by the time you're in your 20s, it's already too late. 
like you've either you've either caught the window or missed it. You know, what I mean, and there are great athletes in twenties who switch sports, but they're already genius athletes. So when it ends up coming down to, and we, I was just talking to, um, uh, where was I? I was talking to, oh, uh, I was, we took our daughters to see a college uh, volleyball tournament this weekend, right? My daughters are into volleyball, and we were watching um, Cal, and there was a big tournament going on, and the University of Hawaii coach. I, he, I, um, sorry, he was Hawaiian. He's from the University of West Virginia, and he used to be the national team coach. And his girls did the best warm-up prep I have ever seen in like college sports. One of the best. Bands, monster walks, pull-aparts, lunges, rotation, hot, sweaty, like the, so smart. Hamstring, just some pull-downs. The, the girl, like the, and it's stuff that he's obviously developed, brought into the program. Then, you know, for the rest of the time, they got a lot of touches. And those girls, he said, when I asked him about it, because I was like, hey, coach, excuse me, I'm just in the stands, but I'm like, who are you and where'd you come up with this stuff? Because a lot of it was some of our stuff, right? And, and he's like, well, this is how we've gotten here. And he's like, most girls, you know, they're playing a top 15 team in the nation. And it turns out that that team, he knew was going to kill him. But he's like, but those girls won't show up till the midway through the second set. He's like, we can get on the board and start winning early, you know. And so his warm up and the girls, the, this under ranked nobody team crushed Santa Clara in the first game, right? Just crushed them. Then Santa Clara started to get you know warm up. The other thing is, he said, is, we've got to do this because the girls I inherit are all damaged goods, all of them. In high school, they're all broken out of high school. They're all overtrained. They have crap mechanics. They've all had shoulder surgeries. It's like, I have to do two things. I have to get these girls ready to play, and I have to teach them everything. You know, how to eat, how to sleep, how to prep, how to get sweaty, how to recognize that they're ready, how to get play, right? And I think the, the thing we're going to have to do if we're serious as a community is that we've got to go back into colleges, and we've got to empower and support the college coaches. And then we've got to take it a step back and be in high school and start, because all our athletes are coming through those programs and they are survivors by the time they get to college and they're survivors by the time they become pros. And it starts earlier than that. You talk to the high school coaches, they're like, yeah, these kids in middle school, they can't run or squat or do anything. So at some point, we're going to get off our asses and continue to support the, the systems behind us so that we inherit kids who are like, oh yeah, Chris Duffin, oh yeah, we just call him Uncle Chris around our house. <laughs> we've, been doing, we've been doing that stuff for 10 years. What else you got for me, coach? I mean, it's got to be that way. Otherwise, you know, shame on us, and we should expect the fact that, uh, you know, kids are going to, you know, roll out, and, and we're going to inherit damaged goods all the time, or kids not even near their genetic potential. I have been really, really uh, happy with the amount of, like, college uh, strength and conditioning coaches that are starting to follow our work. We re recently went to the... Uh, CSCA uh, convention and uh, yeah, we just it's it's great. But you're, like you're saying, there's there's so many untouched colleges and there's the high schools. I mean, I've been into a number of high schools where you see kids coming out of them and it's like, yes, they, you know, I, I don't think their their coaches are empowered with the tools. You know, they don't they don't have the knowledge. They don't have the, you know, in a lot of cases. Well, everyone comes from somewhere, and that was what we were saying about context. Is that, you know, people are products of their system. So, you know, I was just in Yuma, Arizona at the, at the Marine Top Gun School, and what I can tell you is this is the, the, like the third year we've been back there, and to see the changes already, it just takes time, right? We've got it, and, and what we're finding is that the young lieutenants that I've talked to seven years ago are now captains and majors, and they're like, this is the system, and this is what we've been doing, and unfortunately, we may have to have a generation of old, crusty coaches who are the old school. We have to wait for them to retire. And the young kids are coming in look differently. And places like Stanford with Shannon Turley there, you know, strength conditioning coach of the year, you know, really focusing on movement quality, still gets really, really strong kids, gets get kids really strong. But, you know, all of his interns are gonna go off, all those college kids are gonna go off and become coaches. And everyone comes from a system and eventually the systems are are normalizing towards more complete practices. And then we just have to turn the dials, strength, power, speed. Do, you know, what is it we need to do? You know, do, do my swimmers need to bench press? Yes, they do, but not as much as my football players. You know, we've, what's interesting, because we've talked to a lot of strength and conditioning coaches, and what we've found across the board, particularly with uh, major league sports, is that the sport coaches themselves are the old school guys, and they're not listening to the strength and conditioning coaches. And the strength and conditioning coaches that are talented and, and, and are up to speed are being frustrated by the fact that they aren't 
heard. They aren't heard by their their uh, uh, the sport coaches, the offensive line coach, or the defensive back coach, or the hitting coach, whatever, pitching coach. Yeah, that's been yeah. a pretty consistent message we've heard from our coaches. Yeah. Yeah, and on a, and some of that is um, you know those guys have notions of the way strength and conditioning was, right. you know, and uh, you know. We're seeing pockets of enlightenment, we'll put it that way, where, you know, top-down coaches are getting the support they need from the owners because they're realizing, you know, a good example is Mark Uyama. He's the head strength and conditioning coach for the Niners, and you know, he's withstood like five regime changes there, and now he's a VP. They have, you know, he, his process, how he lifts, what he does, the tinker, I mean, he is the most trusted man in that entire organization because he knows everything and supports the players, you know, and so I think... What's starting to happen now is, you know, it's not just about getting guys strong because we know we can get guys strong. But look at the number of non-contact ACLs and, and non-contact, you know, it's, it, you know, spot, there's just so much we can take off. The problem is, and this is what we're going to have to resolve ultimately in our own craft, is that the physios and the sports medicine people are like, there's no proof that what you're doing works, Chris. You guys have no science behind you. And I'm like, right, the science of position. Well, they're, they're like, show me that that's even, you can't even prove that that's full overhead. You know, like, you know, it's ish. There's so much variability in human beings that we can't even decide what's full in the range of motion in the shoulder. I'm like, no, no, no. If I hand you two dumbbells and have you put them over your head, we'll know if it's full range of motion or not because you're going to fatigue out in two seconds and compensate, right? So we've got to do a better job of getting out of the random controlled trial study and into the quantitative analysis, out of the quantitative analysis, into the qualitative. We all live in numbers. The, thing, the reason this matters is that we smash wattage records, we smash strength records, our athletes are faster. Talk to Joe DeFranco. You know, when, when he's trying to you know, get his guys faster in a, in a 20 or a 40, he opens up their hips, you know, and he sees the correlation between improved mechanical efficiency and speed, but we're, we've got to do a better job of really helping codify and coming up with those benchmarks of, of performance mechanics because our movement traditions right now are leading the way and the movement science, as always, is lagging behind. Yeah, no doubt. So when, you, when you're talking about um, going into a fatigue state and compensation, do you think there's any spectrum of acceptability um, through compensation? So say um, athlete is doing 10 rep squat, uh, is there any like level of spectrum of acceptable compensation that could happen uh, during that set? Or are you looking really specifically to have um, really crisp, perfect movement the entire time? Well, let's say that crisp, perfect movement happens in a vacuum and without context of playing, right? But what I should see is that my athletes are improving their quality of efficiency. Look, just because someone has to turn their feet out, right, and they're a little hunchy in the upper back doesn't mean we're not squatting today. Right? But it does mean that I found incomplete movement. But if I see an athlete begin squatting and then something happens, what are we reinforcing there? You know, we're reinforcing a bad motor pattern. And you know, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. So what are you practicing? If the first bench looks good, and I was just watching you bench the other day, Chris, and I was like, man, it's so clean, it's so nice, no elbows flaring, no head wobbles, shoulders aren't coming forward. It's like it's so boring to watch you bench. You know, it's no <laughs> That's excitement. He's not there. very strong. Nothing to assess. <laughs> I know, I know. <laughs> Everything's deadlift for that guy. <laughs> and um, the issue is, I think we're not identifying those acceptability. If it's about getting through ten, I know I can get through ten grinding. So w w is that what I want? Do I want my athlete grinding through ten? Look, if I see a lot of errors in lifting. I don't see people's spines exploding. I don't, you know, we, I've seen people power clean and tear their ACLs. I've seen full clean and tear. I've seen back tweaks and things happen. But rarely does anyone get seriously injured. But if I always let my athletes make a mistake, but if I see the same mistake tw two sets in a row, we are now not making a mistake and correcting it. And the, either the athlete doesn't know what they're doing or they can't hear you know, but if they make a bad rep and then the next one comes back and I can see they're they just lost concentration, that's part of the game. We're, you know, we're getting that immediate feedback. That's why it's so important to do these high rep sets because we get this feedback that I can feed forward into the next rep. But the second I start to see fundamental decay in posture and mechanics, then it's just a grind fest. And at some point we're going to be like, screw it. But what, it doesn't matter ever, you know, because if this is where you're going to default, when, when it matters most, I know you're going to end up in here. And here's the big combo. And I think this is where the Olympic lifters have got it wrong, is that we are not 
Olympic lifting for Olympic lifting's sake, unless you're in Olympic lifting, if you're Cal Strength or one of these guys, then and all you do is Olympic lift, then we can have these conversations. But most of us are using strength and conditioning to get better for skill and sport. And if we are not asking or, or consummating the conversation about position, if your athletes turn their feet out when they swing kettlebells and jump and land, you are part of the stinking problem for why that athlete is tearing their ACL and why they're so stiff in the first place. If all the things that you value is just deadlifting and, and back squatting, which is plenty for most people, do not – that's fine, but do not pretend that your technique is now valid for teaching children how to jump and land, right? Because you are a big, big part of the problem. Yeah, so you, you mentioned Joe DeFranco earlier, and something you just touched on reminded me of him. Um, with a lot of his athletes, I've, I've heard him in interviews and, and, and different discussions that he has, but he doesn't have hardly anyone – do the Olympic lifts for his actual power training. They're doing heavy throws, different jumps, um, and different sprinting patterns. And a lot of that was because he only has these athletes for you know so many weeks at a time. And how good do you are you going to actually be able to get them at the Olympic lifts? You know, I think a lot of um, sport coaches, especially, get stuck in this mindset of you know this lift does this, so I have to do this to do this, and they don't really see you know maybe the entire global spectrum of of what that lift is. A accomplishing or what the actual quality uh, direction that they're aiming for is. So I think one thing that we have to do is, um, is, is begin to have that understanding of, you know, this does not always just equal this, you know, there's, there's a, a handful of things here, you know, maybe if you did, you know, a perfect clean, that would equal the best, you know, uh, power development activity that you could do in the weight room. But, you know, if you can't do it perfectly, there's so many other things you could do that's going to have a much better uh, net result uh, and probably won't uh, just thrash you. Well, here's what you're talking about now. You're talking about the art of coaching, right? <laughs> and that, that is, hey, how much time do I have to develop these athletes? You know, what's going to be appropriate? Because there is a misnomer in strength conditioning, especially strength conditioning for sport. I'm not talking about what we're seeing in the world right now is this artifact that training in the gym is the world, right? People forget powerlifting is a sport you go out and test it. Olympic lifting is a sport you go out and test it. But they're, and they inform a lot of our understanding of how to develop strength and speed, right? Totally. Comma, you know, I don't know how many people spend 10,000 hours walking on their hands and doing all this crazy gym stuff. They're really good and competent in the gym. That's like saying, I nailed this step aerobics class but uh, by the way, because I know all the steps, but I don't play any sports. I don't like people have forgotten that the point is to use the gym to train for something, right? And 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 we've taken powerlifting, and Olympic lifting, and we said, well, okay, that's good enough. We'll just keep training. But those things are very specific outcome goals. The rest of us are training for something. So, you know, do I, you know, we're having a lot of conversations right now with coaches about. Asking, and I'll ask, I'll ask Chris this when we, when we launch this project, what are the key pieces for athletic development in children? Like, wh what do you do? And for us, we think that if you, a kid, you know, from in, you know, elementary school and middle school can front squat and push press and kettlebell swing, I'm going to get them so dialed in that that kid now can basically do almost any other thing and we can start to layer on other programming, right? But you're absolutely right. I mean, if this is your, if you're a front squat like this guy, then I'm like, what the hell are we talking about? You're, you know, you're gonna be a rounded, horrible mess in the back. And if you receive every clean, then no wonder coaches do everything from the hang or coaches are saying, hey, we're doing speed pulls, right? Because we're doing high pulls from the ground because what they saw was, hey, we can take the components out of it and we don't have to fully commit to the sport. But if I have a kid who comes through and is already Olympic lifted for 10 years, you know, then maybe that's the appropriate tool. And, and, and to, your, to your point very much, Joe found that he, he had much better bang for the buck for athletic development for the number of contact hours he could even get, right? Because it's, it's this total mistake that, you know, coaches get billions of hours with their athletes. I mean, talk to, you know, maybe you get more hours in, in college, but you just don't get a lot of hours with your athletes in the professional levels. So how am I going to get some work done and still improve their athleticism? And now, now that's a, a conversation of, hey, I really like this instead of this, right? Do you think that um, we ever have the conversation? You, you talked about early childhood development, and this is really big in other countries. You know, maybe um, 
uh, more towards geared towards the Olympics and it's you know maybe a government thing but do you think we ever have the conversation of this is what an early childhood developmental model looks like um, for future athletes you know right now it seems like you know what coach uh, taught this coach and he picked up from when he was young and this is what I did when I was young so this is what you do do you think we ever actually have the conversation of these are benchmark type things that have to happen in early childhood to produce better athletes we have to have that conversation and and some smart people are Jeff and Mickey Martin of Brand X Kids they have probably the most progressive you know, strength and conditioning skill development that there is, you know, out there right now in terms of their programming. I know a lot of people are, are taking a crack at this, but Brand X kids for really smart athletic development. But w- what you're seeing absolutely is that, you know, it's some dad, you know, volunteering, you know, to teach soccer. And, you know, I, I learned to squat in high school football. So here we go, you know, and we're just, people aren't very sophisticated. Eventually, we're serious. You know, we're going to have to OPE. We're going to have to look at the environmental loads of kids. We're going to have to take this on as a societal issue and say, what do we value? I mean, the, the Germans had this thing called the Turner Gym, and it was about teaching and reinforcing fundamental patterns, which we've been talking about since the 1900s, right? Squat, throw, you know, press, you know, body control, heavy weight. I mean, movement natural by Hebert in the original iteration. If you were, came out of that French tradition, you were a stinking badass, you know what I mean? And, and, and it was really about saying, here is physical you know, literacy so that now people can go do whatever they want. I mean, not everyone needs to go to the Olympics, not everyone needs to be a powerlifter, right? Maybe they should, but uh, not everyone needs to. And, um, but they should be able to do it and say, oh yeah, I learned that until high school and then I got into running. You know what I mean? Like, at some point, we're gonna have to put our big boy pants on and have a real conversation, otherwise, this is all just bullshit. It really is. Because if we're not taking the lessons that we're learning and keep applying them backwards down the chain so that kids come up differently, then we are ju- this is just circus and sport. And when people break, we'll just give their bodies to the lions because they're broken anyway. No, you know, let's we, just, it's entertainment. Yeah. It was, what, it's been 25 years since we've taken physical education out of the curriculum in, in junior high and high school. It's not, yeah. it's not a requirement anymore. And what we've done is we cut, said... They've cut it from a lot of elementary school programs. Yep. Yeah, yeah. It's sad. You know, and, and there's, it's low level. I mean, my wife and I have a... We started a thing at our school called the walking school bus. Like, one of the reasons I was, you know, hustling to get here this morning is that we walk a little over a mile from our house and realized that a lot of kids and parents weren't walking, so we just started a walking school bus. Now we have about 50 kids that join us and parents every morning to walk to school because we are not doing the things that human beings are supposed to do. Right? We're learning about the physiology expressed in the formal language of strength and conditioning. I think we have a really good idea of what we're capable of. But now we need to say, what are the conditions in which that can thrive? And not moving, not teaching you know, movement skills is part of this uh, big gaping hole in the environment. We're, we're, we're going to have to change it. You know, you talked about the coach from West Virginia, and you mentioned another thing about how much time do I have with an athlete. You know, as a mature athlete myself, and I have to represent and ask the questions for active adults, but, you know, if, if kids are broken coming out of high school into college and they're broken uh, in, in, co- in college, think of uh, how many people in America at 50 plus or 55 plus or 60 plus are so broken and how, do, how, do, how much time do they have left and is it too late for them to get started? Uh, to turn their lives around. I was with a guy this weekend, and we were we were at a wedding deal, but uh, uh, the night before we were playing ping pong, and I got so irritated that every time the ball went on the floor, it it was it was like two minutes before he could bend over and pick the ball up. It was ridiculous. I said, you know, <laughs> let's call this off. Where can we go with active adults? What what should they be doing? Well, I think the the first and foremost is. You know, the, the official statement or, or is... In, or inactive. Adults. That's right. It's never too late. <laughs> At no point does your body stop healing. At no point can you reverse. You, know, improve, you can't not improve your position. I mean, unless you're bony blocks on every joint you have in your body. I mean, we're going to get some range. The key here is that people, once again, don't realize that, you know, you've been not moved and you've not had any hip range of motion. You haven't even squat all the way to the ground since Vietnam. It's probably going to take longer than a week to turn that ship around, and you have to reinforce it with good motor patterns. We laugh that uh, Travis Jewett, who's a Cairo on our staff, you know, he's like, 
people didn't read the first half of your book, which is about actually moving well, they go right to the mobilizations. And the first half of the book is how to, you know, the, to apply the principles of physiology into the actual movements that you should be doing. I mean, that's the thing. You know, people are like, you know, I, I mobilized my quads and Chris, and it didn't, it didn't help. And, you, you, and you're like, well, it's because you squat like an ass, you know? And <laughs> you run like, you know, like you're like, no wonder you're stiff, bro. You're stiff because you're moving like crap. And you can't just keep pouring, you know, I keep pouring oil into my car and it just runs out the bottom. It's crazy. I love, so, I love the piece that uh, we filmed where we were talking about, uh, you know, how much time uh, people spend, and I, I broke that down into like a, a 60 second Instagram short. I like to repost and I put in a few articles where it's like if you're doing te- more than 10 minutes worth of mobility work, you're doing something wrong. You got to actually get out there and like actually train and apply load and you know do these things correct. That's right. That's right. And you know you have to have a physical practice. So one of the first things we talk about with our with our older athletes, you know, and remember my my mother in law trains at my gym, right? And her training looks different than my training only in so much as the range of motion and loads. Otherwise, she presses, she rows, she pulls, she carries heavy stuff around. We even sit down and do rolling. We do some basic gymnastics, right? And the key here, I think, for most adults is that we're trying to do it ourselves because we think we're experts in everything by the time we're an adult. And you need a coach. So go get in a yoga class. Go find some badass, good-looking Pilates instructor. Go down to your local gym. Right, start lifting some weights under, you know, there's no reason that you couldn't stay with a barbell, you know, a children's barbell for the first two months. And if you just squatted a, you know, 15 kilo bar for a year, I guarantee you, your life is going to change. But you're greedy and egotistical and you're going to start chasing that 22 year old guy around because you're still 22 in your head. But what we're seeing is that people don't even have a movement practice. You know, there's a good test that uh, a predictor of mortality, and that's can you, you know, get up off the ground without using your hands? And the more points of contact you have to use to get up off the ground, the more likely it is that you're going to die early. Well, isn't that just stupid range of motion? I mean, you can't sit on the ground. I, I went to a, a, there's a big sports club called the Olympic Club here. It's, a, it's a cool, very, very shishi, really good athletes there. They do a lot of, they do, to support sports like rugby and they're just great folks. And I did a, I did a, like a two hour talk there and I made every, I had like 200 people sitting on the ground and just to watch the diagnostics of 200 people sitting on the ground, I was like, what are we talking about? I mean, you, you people can't even sit on the ground. You know, they're, everyone's uncomfortable and they, you know, rounded and their hips are up and their knees. And I was like, I mean, you're supposed to sit on the ground. You're supposed to be able to get up and off the ground all the time. The number one people reason people end up in nursing homes, wait for it, they can't get up off the ground. And so what's interesting is that if we put the practice first, show me that you're doing some squats, then we can talk about how many and how often and how heavy we're going. But you know, for one of the things that we do for all our older athletes who are not competitive, you know, and I put that in quotation marks, who, aren't, who are just training, any lifting is always sandwiched between some hardcore cardiorespiratory demand. They got to get on the bike. So, hey, we're going to bench today, but we're going to row a thousand between every bench set. Why? Because that takes three to five minutes anyway. So instead of you standing around, I'm going to get you hot and sweaty. You know, so I'm going to try to. You know, it takes a lot longer to get people warm. You know, we've got to. You know, take take into consideration that their tissues are probably brittle and not. So the the training looks the the little bit different, but it is the same stinking training. You are going to deadlift. It may just be a kettlebell from the ground, but we're going to deadlift today. Why? Because you have to deadlift. You That's have, what we you do. Have, you have to pick up something off the ground. That's a natural human function. And if you don't train for that, what are we talking about? And if you can't reconcile spinal mechanics there with how we teach it in rehab, also, you know, you, you're doing everyone who comes out of rehab a disservice, right? People should be able to come out of rehab and be like, oh, I learned how to stiffen my trunk and organize myself so I had better alignment. You know, I think this is the thing that drives me crazy. You know, um, you know people just bend down and deadlift. And I'm like, look, this is a complex motor skill. Let's pretend like this is golf. You just, uh, just, you just got to the golf club you know, in, in 17 different ways, and you wonder why you have 17 different swings and 17 different contacts with the ball, right? We're trying to reduce movement variability so it becomes so simple that you don't have to do it as a linebacker. You're just automatically set up. Like I never have to coach my daughter into a flat back anymore. You know why? Because we have swung the kettlebell 50,000 times. We've, our, we've organized and squeezed our butt in the front rack. You know what I mean? Like she knows how to sequence her spine so that when she's playing volleyball, she doesn't have to think about it anymore. And that's what we've got to do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Doesn't get me fired up. That's great. No, that's great. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, we're uh, we're heading up uh, close to our our uh, time here, but Kelly, uh, thank you for the great insight. I mean, there's so much we could obviously talk to you for four or five, ten hours, whatever, and would love to have you come back again. Uh, you know, not not too distant future to continue our conversation. Uh, it would be my pleasure, and really, you know, we point so many people what you guys are doing, especially since. You know, I never ever want to get into the language of skill transfer exercises and, you know, like that's, that's gym craft. I'm like, I can help really solve this, you know, this positional competency piece, but gym craft, I mean, you, what you guys are doing is you're giving people such good resources and tools and I never have to explain away anything that you do. And I think that's what we want people to understand that, uh, you know, that when you see people talking, you shouldn't have to be like, well, that doesn't make sense or that doesn't jive. And if there is dissonance there, then you, someone should need to explain their rationale. Yep. Not, you know, yep. otherwise it's the same, same conversation. Yeah, I absolutely love the, uh, the Mobility Wad site. And I think what you're doing is so complimentary and we're not, you know, with uh, our Kabuki.ms program. Like, it's like, you know, here's how we resolve issues. And then we've got, this is how we move. This is how we train. And this is how we actually gain visibility of the issues that you're having. Um, so I just, uh, I love the work that you're doing. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's just a fantastic compliment to what uh, what we're doing as well. I appreciate so, that. And you guys have a shoulder rock on the table there. We do. And, uh, and I want to point those, those out to swi people, Those swimmers you talked about. That's oh, <laughs> you know, I think it's like two to 4,000 years old, the, the Indian clubs, yep, you know? Right. Yep. And uh, teaching people to store energy, teaching people to control these corners. If you swing that thing around, your elbows will never bark at you ever again. Right, because you have to do these things called be a human being. You can spend, you know, two hours climbing trees, or you can spend ten minutes throwing that thing around. And I guarantee you, it's gonna hold, bring all your problems. My number one favorite train tool I have is an Onnit mace, and I swing that mace a couple times a week because it, a, it's athletic. I'm applying strength to something, and it hits all of these strange corners and teaches me to be stable in all these shapes. It's just that thing rules. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get you down one of these because uh, the lever on this is designed a bit uh, more ergonomically. It's designed on the classical length uh, where it's supposed to be. So I think you'll really like it. So we'll uh, we'll get one down for you to play with. Appreciate uh, it. And also, I just want to say that um, you know we've been smashing with barbells for a long time, but the pain pill and the boomstick. If people are listening to this, I'm such a fan, and like everyone at our gym loves those things. I mean, they absolutely love them, and for be able to take on some of those grisly tissues, and uh, it, it is so so simple and elegant, and it's a beautiful. Like when we all die, those things will remain, and they'll be like, "This was an enlightened culture." <laughs> you know? It's so, a work of art. <laughs> I appreciate that. Actually, sometimes I get tempted. I'm like, I should just post these 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 texts that Kelly sends me. He's like, everybody at the gym's fighting over the pain pill. We like, love yes. it so much. Post and I'm that. like, <laughs> post that thing for sure. So good. So, so keep 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 developing tools because that's that's what people need. They, you know, the the mistake is that, and I think this is where I, the the arrogance in my field really just you know it gets my hackles up. Is that people know what works and what doesn't work. You know, and what, what the, the physios, there are a group of physios who believe that, you know, what you're doing, what I'm doing, and the other enlightened people are doing is, like, we're somehow tricking people. And, you know, because th there's no science behind it. And I'm like, you know what works? When people get into better positions and they feel better and they lift better, right, and their expression as output is better and they don't have to do as much of it tomorrow, that's called the scientific process. And pe what they're saying, basically, is that people aren't smart enough to know what works and what doesn't work. Because <laughs> ask any athlete who's ever been given a program who abandons it, right? And you're like, why do you do that? And they're like, this is wasting my time, you know? And every athlete who does something that makes works, they see it work, they do it obsessively. And I think that's the key. If we keep putting tools out that empower people to make decisions for themselves, you know, we'll get there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for uh, chatting with us today, Kelly. You've got a few books out, Desk Bound, Ready to Run, and obviously the, um, the ever-popular Supple Leopard. Um, where can uh, people learn more about you and, and, and find out what you're up to? Well, we are at, at MobilityWAD 
and again, if I could change that name, mobility again, it's just been, <laughs> it's been co-opted like extreme or work, you know. But we're work out of the day, you know. We're reminding people that uh, in our in our in our titles that this is a daily practice. Improving your positional competency is a daily practice, and um, you know we're all around there. I do want to put, uh, do a special shout out to um, our nonprofit. It's called Stand Up Kids. And, uh, you know, to date, our daughters are at the first all-standing moving school in the world. They're, they got rid of the sitting desks and have created these movement-rich environments for kids. We have about 37,000 kids standing now as a function of this program. And uh, there's some research has come out that said, hey, we can really make a huge difference in childhood obesity. So, you know, the, the way we're going to solve this is local parents and coaches get involved at the school level locally. I mean, this is how we're going to solve it. So take a look at Stand Up Kids. That's probably the most important thing we're ever going to do with our lives. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you very much, Kelly. Thank Thanks, you guys. Much. We really look forward to talking with you again. Pleasure.